For some countries, geography is destiny. This is true of Laos, a tiny country in Southeast Asia. Laos is a little bigger than Minnesota and a little smaller than Michigan, just about the size of Utah. It is shaped like an amoeba with a long, narrow tail. Mountain ranges, highlands, and plateaus compose 70% of the land mass. Some of the peaks reach as high as 9,000 feet. These mountains have produced massive barriers to communication from ancient times until today. Transportation between communities was, and often still is, difficult or impossible. Travel through the highlands in the past could only be accomplished by foot, ox cart, or horse. For this reason, mountain people tended to stay in their own small communities, separate from each other and from the centers of power. They developed their own cultures, their own languages, and their own religions, many of which have endured until today. Ethnologists count 49 distinct cultures and a total of 82 separate languages. The south of Laos is flatter, more homogeneous, and more prosperous. It is inhabited mainly by the dominant culture, the Lao. Rice paddies dot the landscape along the Mekong, whose annual flood deposits rich alluvial soil. Farming flourishes. The Mekong and Nam U and their tributaries on the western border of Laos provide an easy means of transportation and communication between towns. Laos is a landlocked country surrounded by many often hostile neighbors. On the east, it shares a 1,300-mile border with Vietnam, on the north, a 264-mile border with China, and a 146-mile border along the Mekong with Myanmar. On the west, a 1,000-mile border with Thailand, and in the south, a 336-mile border with Cambodia. Laos has been struggling with three of its neighbors, Thailand, Burma, and Vietnam, for generations. Incursion after incursion, occupation after occupation have occurred. At times, Laos was on the winning side. At other times, the entire region was enveloped in power struggles. Sometimes, Laos served as a buffer between belligerent forces. Sometimes the whole country was virtually swallowed up by neighboring powers. Lan Sang was the first real Laotian state. It was founded by Fa Agum in 1357. Fa Agum's father had seduced one of his own father's wives, and as a consequence, he and Fa Agum were exiled from the city. Vanagam and his father fled to Angkor, where they gained respect, notoriety, and success. When Angkor was threatened by Thailand, the king of Angkor recruited Vanagam and sent him with an army of 10,000 men to confront this menace. Vanagam soon prevailed and then took on other rulers in the area and subdued them as well. At the height of his success, Van Agum founded the kingdom of Lan Sang. This country was also called Land of a Million Elephants Under a White Parasol, a long and descriptive name portraying both hard and soft power. The elephant denoted the army which used elephants in their attacks, much like we use tanks today. Parasols were a symbol of Buddhism. Lan Sang was the first kingdom in Southeast Asia to adopt Buddhism, a religion that unified the people within the country and eventually spread to all of Southeast Asia. 
Van Gum expanded his empire from Tonkin, or Hanoi, in Vietnam to Isan on the border with Thailand. The ruler in Angkor, who had originally conscripted Van Gum to fight for him, was not happy with Van Gum's disloyalty, but was busy fighting on two other fronts and was too distracted to pay much attention. Lan Sang had a turbulent history. In the 350 years that it existed as a kingdom, there were multiple disputes about succession as leaders died or were overthrown. When the lines of succession were not clear, the state was thrown into turmoil, chaos, and bloodshed as different groups vied for power. After 70 years of crises, King Surinya Vongsa became head of state. He ruled from 1638 to 1695. The country entered a long period of stability that some call the Golden Age of Laos. During this time, the kingdom increased in size and prosperity. A European mission visited Phientian in 1641 and one of the Dutch merchants, Garrett van Weistoff, wrote a journal describing a festival that he witnessed there. Seated on a white elephant, the king arrived from the town and passed in front of our tents. We did as the others were doing and knelt down on the path. He is a man of around 23. About 300 soldiers marched in front of him with lances and rifles. Behind him, a few elephants, with armed men following behind several musicians. After that came 2,000 soldiers, who were followed by 16 elephants carrying the king's wives. When Serenya Vongsa died in 1695, the battle for succession renewed itself, and this time it was so bitter and prolonged that the kingdom of Lan Sang broke apart. Three separate states emerged, Luan Prabang in the north, Vientiane at the center, and Sham Pasak in the south. The neighboring kingdoms, sensing the weakening of the central state, invaded. For 114 years, from 1779 to 1893, Laos was ruled by Siam. In 1893, the Chinese attacked Luan Prabang. The ruler of Luan Prabang, unhappy about being a Siamese vassal, was not ready to succumb to the Chinese. But in the weakened condition of his state, his options were limited. So he turned to France and expanding colonial power as his best chance to protect his territory from the Chinese and to become free of the occupying Siamese. France took over the three kingdoms in 1893 and reunited them for the first time in 300 years. The French stayed until World War II when the Japanese took temporary command. When the war was over, France returned, but granted Laos independence in 1953. The French installed the king, Sisavang Vong, to the monarchy. He died in 1959 and was succeeded by his son, Savang Vatana, who would become the very last king of Laos. After independence, a civil war broke out between the government forces and the communist Pathet Lao. In 1975, after about 30 years of struggle, the Pathet Lao won. Laos became a communist state, the Lao People's Democratic Republic. The king, Savang Vathana, resigned and was eventually sent to a brutal work camp where he died. Laos then cut off trade with other countries and became isolated much like North Korea today. Between 1970 and 1975, Laos was pulled into the Cold War. The United States engaged Laos in what was called a secret war. 
The U.S. wanted to destroy the Vietnamese strongholds in Laos and along the part of the Ho Chi Minh Trail that ran through Laos. The U.S. dropped nine million tons of bombs on this small country, more than they had dropped during all of World War II. In fact, Laos holds the dubious distinction of being the most heavily bombed country in the world. After hostilities ended, there were two million tons of unexploded bombs still on the ground. Many, many Laotians have suffered death, loss of limbs, and other injuries after accidentally coming into contact with these landmines. Even today, there are many places strewn with these dangerous cluster bombs. The government and the schools try to train children to be on guard against them. But many times, small children find a small, round, shiny object, pick it up, and lose their lives, their limbs, or their vision, even today. Laos is poor, one of the poorest places in the world. In 1975, the communist government was austere and puritanical, reflecting the beliefs of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. The policies introduced created hardships for the people and were very unpopular. The Lao people began to starve. The collective farms were inefficient and the centralized economy was not working. The government did not reflect the will of the people. As a consequence, many Laotians fled to Thailand. When conditions became intolerable for the people, government was astute enough to introduce market reforms. They allowed farmers to return to their own farms. They began to reach out to the world for foreign investment, first from Thailand and later more broadly. In 1997, they joined ASEAN, an acronym denoting the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. In 1997, they joined the World Trade Organization. Economic development depends upon the education of the population, and education in Laos has long been a problem. The Laotian education system developed slowly. Until the mid-20th century, there were few government schools, particularly in the highlands. Our guide, Sam Fawn, told us about his difficult early experiences in school. My village don't have the school. And every day we go to walk Monday to Friday, go three hours and come back in total nearly six hours. Buddhist temples provided what education existed. The curriculum was very primal, consisting of basic reading in Lao and Pali, the Buddhist holy language, arithmetic, religion, and a few other social subjects. There were no high schools in the mountain villages. To continue after primary school, the students would have to move to urban centers and become Buddhist monks. Uh, many uh, students uh, from the countryside, they run to the town and for education yeah, and going to be a monk. Girls were excluded from this education. My four sisters, they never go to school. They don't have education. Buddhism allows people to become monks and then withdraw from the religious order when it no longer suits them. So if a boy wanted an education, he might become a monk during his high school years and then when finished, leave the monastery and pursue another profession. As in the past, there is still a huge problem in Laos regarding education. Only the Lao culture, composing 55% of the population, has a written language. The other ethnic minorities do not. Non-Lao children from the mountain villages are taught Lao, a language foreign to them. Often their teacher is Lao and does not speak their language or identify with their culture. These children become discouraged and frequently drop out of school, come to school only intermittently, and have to repeat grades. 
Most villages today have a primary school, but teachers are often poorly trained and poorly and irregularly paid. Because of their low pay, they need to hold other jobs, and so they may dismiss school early or not hold school at all on a particular day. There are few books and few supplies. Currently, the government devotes 3.5% of its gross national product to education. The U.S. spends 5.4%, as does Canada, while Costa Rica spends 7%. 3.5% is much better than in the past, but because of its huge educational needs, it is not enough. Even paying teachers a living wage and delivering that salary in a timely way can make a difference in whether a teacher is in the classroom or not. The government is attempting to make these reforms. The Laotian people are Laos' best and most valuable resource. The population of Laos is very diverse. 81% are rural and only 19% are urban. 36% are under 15 years of age. Ethnologists count 49 ethnic groups and four main linguistic groups who speak a total of 82 separate languages. They are divided according to the altitude at which they live. The dominant population, the Lao, lives in the lowlands, where the soil is rich and where the major cities are situated. The other two major groups live in the uplands, in the footlands, or in the mountains. All of these groups are distinct from one another. They have different languages, religious practices, traditions, and customs. The Lao, living below 1,000 feet, often along the Mekong River, is the largest and the wealthiest group. They make up 55% of the population. One trait that is universal in the country is the friendliness and courtesy of the people. Whether in Vientiane, the capital, or in the small mountain villages, the stranger and friend alike is greeted with warmth. Laotians are a beautiful people. Most are of a soft brown color. The men are thin and wiry, while the women have long, straight, thick hair and lovely oval eyes. Their greeting is to hold their hands with their palms together in front of them and to bow their head. This means hello, goodbye, and thank you. It is a greeting that bestows honor, warmth, and respect. A new president came into power in Laos in 2016 named Boonhang Varadhith, and he is quite popular. The people think that his intentions are good. Past presidents would start building multiple opulent houses upon assuming power. Varadhith still lives in the same house as the one he had when he entered office. The Laotians take this as a very good sign. This president has made many strides in improving the lives of his people. The economy is growing briskly at up to 7% per year. With its extra money, the government is bringing schools and health care clinics to each village and encouraging the residents to rebuild their houses in cement block construction rather than the palm fronds and wood that was the standard in the past. A majority of the villages now have electric wires strung from house to house, providing light in villages that were dark just a few years ago. Electricity is also a source of foreign exchange. Laos has built a large number of hydroelectric facilities, damaging the environment but providing income to the country. Laos sells its extra electricity to its neighbors, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and China. The land is the second most important resource in Laos. The landscape is indeed beautiful. It is rich and green, filled with cascading waters, soaring layers of Karsk mountains, tumbling rivers, lush green forests, and large blue lakes. The population of Laos is small, and there is much open space between settlements. 
The beauty of the landscape bodes well for the growth of ecotourism in this country. The town of Van Vieng, for example, is in the heart of the Karsk Mountains. It features the Namsong River, multitudinous caves, and extraordinary mountains. Tubing through caves, kayaking on the Namsong River, ziplining, trekking, rock climbing, ballooning, and mountain biking are offered here already to large groups of Asian tourists. The other engines of economic growth are mining, gold and copper primarily, and textiles. A challenge to Laos is to use these resources while still protecting the environment. The biggest threat to the environment is corruption. The current president is something of an environmentalist, and would like to expand the protected areas. But illegal logging, aided and abetted by big Vietnamese companies and the Vietnamese army, persists. Corrupt Laotian officials are also implicated. A method of farming called slash and burn also damages the environment. Farmers in the highlands clear their land by cutting trees and then burning the resulting fields to remove the stumps and underbrush. This method pollutes the air and adds to the already abundant deforestation. The government discourages this practice and would like to move many farmers to the lowlands where they can grow rice without slashing or burning the forest. As in many authoritarian states, the government controls all of the media. If a political dissident is an irritant, he or she is arrested. If they are enough of a threat, they disappear. As did the civil society leader, Sombath Somphone, at a police checkpoint in 2012. Despite all of their difficulties, the Laotians are a happy, hopeful people. Life is difficult here. There is much corruption. There is much poverty. You have to work hard to feed your family, and sometimes even then you fall short. But things are better than in the past when the collective farms and the centralized economy left no room for individual growth. And educational opportunities are much better than in the past. So uh, I would like to give very good education to my son. I send him to the school. It's not like me. <laughs> yeah, for me, I start at the primary school when I'm nine years. But my son is uh, five years. Yeah, he study very well now. The hope of Laos is in its people. The hope is that they will continue to grow and change, to seek more education for their children and demand more accountability from their leaders. They are the guardians of one of Earth's most beautiful places, and they must protect it for themselves, for their children, and for all of the inhabitants of the Earth. <laughs>